Well, hello, good morning, and welcome to Grace morning, Fellowship. Yeah, a church for all nations online. Absolutely. We are here. How are you doing, dude? I'm doing well. How good, are you? Good, good. Can't complain you at all. You look amazing, by well, the bro, way. Bro, you look good. Yeah, I like your t-shirt. Hey, I like yours. Oh, thank you. Grace Fellowship Great gear. Like. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I love it. Well, hey, we are excited to continue the service, the, our online experience this morning. Pastor Jeff is continuing his sermon series in the name of love and last week was so incredible yes. so encouraging and i am looking forward to this week i know it's going to be great yeah it's awesome you yeah. know i love the fact that now grace is hosting all three of our in-person services at 8 30 10 and 11 30. and last week was amazing we had a lot of response great attendance yes. Uh, Grace Kids, of course, is open, representing all of birth through fifth grade. Yep. And I just want to give a huge shout out to all of our volunteers that have been serving and working hard ever since we've opened. Yes. And now with our third service opening. And look, there's more opportunities for you to serve. If you want to serve, get online, fill out a Connect card, Indeed. and uh, we will contact you. And not only has Grace Kids been open, but Grace Students opened up oh, sure. on our 1130 service. So if you have students, 6th grade through 12th grade, we are here for you. And I know that last week they kicked it off they did. really strong. They did yes, really, really well. Yes. And they've just been waiting to come back. So we're glad indeed. that we can offer that for them. Yes, indeed, it was great. And listen, we are going to continue our online streaming experience. And if you want to maximize your streaming experience, like I just said, we have a wonderful opportunity to you. You should go to gogracefellowship.org and watch from our website. There you will find uh, interaction with our team members. If you need to chat or, or talk to us about anything, if you have prayer requests, we would love to pray for you and follow up with you. That is the best uh, way to watch our services online. And also, we're going to continue to have content throughout the week. Things such as Worship Wednesday, we do every single Wednesday um, at 10 a.m. on Facebook. Instagram and YouTube. Also, Deep Dive will continue every month. It will be once a month, every first Wednesday. Um, we want to share that with you, and that's an opportunity for you um, to hear from Pastor Jeff and some of our other pastors as they dive deeper into Scripture and the things of God, and it's just an incredible opportunity you don't want to miss. You know, that's really yeah, exciting, man. and so is this next announcement. Christmas at Grace. Can you, can you hear those bells? That's right. Can you believe we're already here? <laughs> I can't, man. Christmas at Grace. And crazy. in case you're wondering, we have our annual Legacy Christmas offering yeah, here man. at Grace. For and sure. it's an opportunity for God's generosity to be poured out through great people just yeah. like you yeah, uh, to give in I like that, that service. I like how you said that. Thank you. I appreciate oh, really? that. You know, yeah. I, want, I want to be a generous person. Absolutely. And I God suppose in order to, to be generous, you, you give to do hey, that. Right? Hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. Time, talent, and, treasure. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about that. Pastor Jeff's going to have an awesome Christmas series. Yes. Can't get into too much of that just hey. yet right here just now. And also, December 6th is our starting point class. And it's our last one of the year. Can yes, you believe that? I can't. And Starting Point is pretty much on ramp for everything Grace. If you're interested in knowing more about Grace or even joining our church, Starting Point via Zoom will be for you. And that's at 1.30 on December 6th. So if you go to our website, gogracefellowship.org forward slash starting point, Fill out the registration form there, and we will connect with you and make sure you get plugged in Absolutely. to that class. You won't want to miss it. It's okay. really an awesome class. And then lastly, lastly, can you believe this? Lastly. December 13th, mm. beach baptism. Wait. Beach, can you believe that? In December? In December. Wow. You know, God doesn't stop saving people in December. He doesn't. And, and he uh, keeps the weather warm here, I guess. He keeps the weather. That's why we're here, right? I love it. Continue to baptize people. <laughs> and if you've made a decision for Jesus Christ and you're looking to take the next step, then water baptism is for you. Mm. Our next be beach baptism service here at Grace is December 13th. We meet at Ocean Reef Park at 5 p.m. And you can go to our website, gogracefellowship.org forward slash baptism. 
fill out the registration card again, and we will contact you. I want to mention that Beach Baptism mm -hmm. is not the only place that we do baptisms. Yeah. You can get baptized here at Grace any at any, any time, any service, whatever you choose, whatever is convenient for you. But specifically, our beach baptism is a lot of fun. Sure. And a lot of people have gone to that. And it's just fun to be out there it and, is. and experience all of you together. Absolutely. So guess what? I think... I think that we've reached the end. Already? I think we have, right. and I believe that service starts. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Fellowship Online. We are so glad that you chose to join us this morning. We're going to sing a new song for you guys. We hope you enjoy it. You are good. Your kindness is healing. Your mercy life-giving. You are good.
Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing God. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until there was a call His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished It is finished No power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Oh, I came from His An answer, but this I know with all my heart. His boots have made my ransom. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom
thing for us God you've already done so much in sending your son thank you for Jesus thank you for what he means to us God you're so worthy and it's in your mighty name we pray
Amen. Thank you so much, worship team, for that incredible music this morning. Well, guys, welcome again to Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. We're so glad to have you here. Listen, one of the things that we believe deeply in is that the Lord has brought us together. And for a local church to be a good, strong gospel outpost, especially here in Palm Beach County in South Florida, we need to connect with one another. So something we believe uh, that is effective and helpful is our online connect card. We actually have a QR code here and all you have to do is take your smart device, open up the photo app, point it at the screen and uh, the connect card will be right there available to you on your device. Let us know if you have a question about the Bible, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus Christ to become a serious committed Christian, or maybe it's to be baptized. You have questions about that. Let us know wherever you are, whatever maybe your prayer request, your prayer need is, and we will connect with you you. We also have an app, a Grace Fellowship app, and you can get that if you text Grace WPB app to 77977. It's an incredible tool, lots of resources on there uh, to connect with us at Grace. We also have another opportunity for those of you who have children. It's called Awana at Home. You can go to gogracefellowship.org forward slash Awana at home and all of the information is there. And that's a great equipping tool for you parents to be able to teach the word of God to your children. We have coming up in a couple of weeks on Sunday, December 6th, our Christmas uh, legacy offering. This is a great process that we have an event every single year uh, to give to a specific ministry opportunity here at Grace. And so this year, uh, we are focusing on developing our property next door uh, so that we can develop this entire campus in time to reach as many people as we can. Because guys, we have over 60,000 people a day on Okeechobee Boulevard driving past our location. So we just want to exercise generosity together. If you're a member or regular attender, I really, really encourage you to begin praying uh, about how the Lord would lead you to give. And again, you can give here uh, on campus or online. And there's those opportunities, the website, the mobile app, or here uh, in the house. So I'm going to have a time of prayer, and then we're going to jump into studying God's word here in just a few moments. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we are thankful to know you. We're thankful for your word, how you have preserved it, how you have brought us to this place. And whether we are uh, Christians who have followed you for some time or whether we are seeking out truth or seeking out whether we should uh, even consider giving church another try, uh, Lord, give us the guidance that we need. Help us to see the beauty of Jesus in your word here this morning. And for those of us that are followers of Christ, we may even be new Christians here in this church. Help us to begin uh, to live generous lives. And for those of us that you just brought us to that place, help us to go even deeper with our generosity uh, in this time for your glory. We thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Love is patient. Like not honking the horn when you're already 11 minutes late. Love is kind. It's doing all the chores so she can wake up to a clean house. It does not envy. Being truly joyful when your friend gets the promotion even if you didn't. It does not boast. Love does not remind your kid of his 20 game losing streak. It is not proud. How about we apologize more often? It is not rude. And let's not value alike over someone's feelings. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not bring up the past, even though right now it'll be really convenient and totally win me this argument. Good night. Always trusts. Always leans into the promises. Always hopes. Always sees what's possible. Always perseveres. Always gets up one more time. Love never fails. And it's always worth it. Welcome once again to Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. So good to have you here today as we continue in our brand new series, second week, In the Name of Love. 
We're walking through 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and what has often been known as the love chapter in the word of God. And I want to also uh, encourage you to put on your calendar Sunday, December 13th. We have our next and our last beach baptism in the decade known as 2020 at Ocean Reef Park. And so uh, if you are ready to be baptized, we would love to baptize you. Maybe for uh, others of us, we are still working through about what Christianity means. I mean, whether the Bible's true, uh, whether God is real. And it may be that today the Lord just brings you over that line, helps you step over that line into the arms of Jesus. You say, you know what? I believe it's true. I'm ready to follow Christ. We would be honored to baptize you at the ocean in December. And what's incredible is here in South Florida, you can actually do that. And guess what? We'll probably still sweat at the beach baptism here in SoFlo. So you can let us know. Uh, any interest, or even if you have questions about what does any of that mean, uh, baptism, let us know through uh, the online connect card. We would love to, uh, to guide you through that. So let's go in the word of God this morning as we talk about what love actually is. And we'll see from 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 7 that love endures all things. So let's read this passage and we're going to come right back through. And this is basically our outline because it's so incredibly clear. Here's what the word of God says. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Love endures all things. So this is, this is one of the passages in the word of God to where it's just so incredibly accessible. It's so amazingly clear that our outline this morning is basically like the words right here from the word of God. And in fact, this section, verses 4 through 7, is really the heart of this love chapter. And so what I, what I want to happen this morning is for you to be able to see the character of Jesus Christ, to see the heart of God in these verses, and, and to walk away not just informed about another sermon, or maybe if this is your first time at Church Online, we welcome you into the conversation. Listen, we don't want you just to leave with bare information. We want you to leave having experienced the love of Jesus Christ. So let's look at what the Word of God says love is and what love is not. First, in verse 4, love is patient and kind. That's what love is. To be patient, this has the sense of being active. So in a family scenario, uh, love is often shown by patience. The way you show somebody in your family that you love them is by exercising Patience. Now, let's just say right out of the gate this morning that it is easy to love people who are easy. You know what I mean? I mean, the people that you're around and they don't annoy you, they agree with you, their personality is enjoyable to be around, uh, the views that they hold don't rub you the wrong way, they're just easy. Now, guys, hear me. I'm not saying that you should try to surround yourself with difficult people just to make it difficult for yourself. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what the word is saying. But you really can't exercise patience. You really can't exercise love unless there's an opportunity to do that. And why in the world would you have to show patience if Everything was easy. So instead of viewing uh, some people that are affectionately known as EGRs, extra grace required, any, you know anybody like that? Maybe they're with you. Please don't point to them, right? But we all know somebody in our life, and it's just like, oh, man, when we see them coming or we see their name pop up, text message call, we're like, like, take a deep breath. This is going to be, Lord, help me, right? Lord, help me. I, I need you to deal with this person. I, I need you to help me not check out when this person is being themselves. So when we have the tendency to be impatient and to be unkind, that's actually an opportunity for us to exercise the love of God by showing patience. An incredible 
I guess it's more like a dissertation than it is an actual sermon, but it's by Jonathan Edwards several hundred years ago called The End for Which God Created the World. I mean, talk about the biggest topic you could possibly imagine. Like, why did God create this thing called the universe? And in that, he explains that the universe was created for the glory of God. But the glory of God is not at odds with what is deepest and best for us. The glory of God is actually a corresponding truth to what is uh, what creates in us the most deep abiding sense of joy and happiness. And he, he writes, the more happiness, this is Edwards, the greater union. When the happiness is perfect, the union is perfect. Namely, that point that most people want to get to in their lives, that, 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 that place of Love, that place of satisfaction, that is only found in living for the glory of God. And that is, as Edward said, the greater the union between us living for the glory of God uh, and our happiness, that's actually what makes it exist in the first place. But there's some of us today who so we'll say, Pastor Jeff, like, I, I know it's in the Bible, be patient and kind, but what I need to do is I need to find myself. Now, sometimes we may be tempted to say, well, just look in the mirror. That's where you are. You're right there. But, we, you know, that can, can be understood as being a little facetious. So people say, oh, I, I want to I I find myself. I want to I do me. I want to understand who I really am. If God exists, the only way you can actually understand yourself in a deep, like, meaningful way is an accurate and honest way to understand who you really are is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You understand that you have been fearfully and wonderfully made, that you've been created by God for his glory and for your good. And the way that you find that deep sense of satisfaction, that some people say, well, I need to go you know, up in the Himalayas. I need to go you know, out in the outback and I need to stay out there for 60 days and find out who I really am. Listen, the way, none of those things are bad. Feel free to travel like once, once things open back up. But the way you really understand who and what you are as you look at the one who created you and the one who offers you redemption, salvation, deliverance, and rescue through Jesus Christ. So love is patient and kind. It may be that if you're a follower of Christ, one of the most profound impacts you can have on those in your life is in the moments in which you are exasperated by them, through the power of Jesus Christ, through his spirit's work inside you and through you, you say, Lord, help me to develop patience. Now, it's interesting in the word of God that um, patience is almost always something that is developed by being under pressure and being in a difficult uh, situations. God almost never just says, okay, one day like we're, we're just crazy impatient. That's where we are. It's our lack of maturity. It's our lack of character. And the next day it's like, boom, oh, now I'm patient. No, God has chosen in his divine sovereign plans to work and a process in your life, in my life, giving us frustrating people and frustrating circumstances. So where we can exercise patience and kindness. Notice verse four continues. Love does not envy or boast. Now, envy, it means to have intense negative feelings over another's achievements or success. But if I really love someone, or we could say it this way, if I'm acting in love towards someone, I will not be threatened by their success. In fact, if I truly am acting out of love for someone, I, I cheer their success. I don't want to envy it. Love does not envy or boast. Boasting is, is the posture of trying to elevate ourselves over people to dominate them. It's to try to put out that air of I'm better than you or I know more than you or I'm superior to you. But according to God's word, love does not do that. Love says I am here to serve you. Because there is someone far greater than me. His name is Jesus Christ, and he gave me what I could have never earned or deserved. That is a relationship with God. That is forgiveness. So the Christian posture, brothers and sisters, is never one of trying to assert our mastery or our superiority or we know more than somebody else or anything like that. But the posture of God has served me through Jesus Christ, so I want to serve others. And let me say this for our married folks. You are on the same team. I know you realize we see 
that at this point in the game of life, this year has been very difficult on many marriages. There are some that are thriving, but there are some to where we already had fracture points coming into this year. We already had some challenges. We already had some infighting. We already had a, an unhealthy type of competition between husband and wife. Let me remind you that for the glory of God, you are a team. Guys, do not let her success threaten you. Your security is in Jesus Christ, and you are one flesh. If she succeeds, you do as well. And ladies, don't let his success on any level feel, make you feel like you are less than because you are for him. You are a team. Love does not envy, and love does not boast. And there are some of us say, okay, Pastor Jeff, I get that. But, you know, for me, it's not so much envying the people in my home or my mom, or dad, or kids, or somebody close. Um, it's when I see, like, really evil people in the world that seem to be prospering. They seem to do, be doing incredibly well. I would, I would ask that you write down Psalm 73. It's an entire psalm dedicated to this issue that people have dealt with for thousands of years. This is like 3,000 years old, where the psalmist says, but as for me, this is in verse 2, Psalm 73, my feet had almost stumbled, my, st my steps had nearly slipped. Why? For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So there's this person who's writing this psalm and they see people who are trying to serve God and their life is full of problems and they see those people who are blaspheming God and running absolutely in the opposite direction seeming I mean it seems that their life is incredibly easy and prosperous so there's this really profound challenge but then in verse 16 it says but when I thought how to understand this it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Guys, do not look at other people's success who may not be following God and think that somehow that's how it ends. The word of God helps us to look and to have a perspective that goes beyond our present circumstance. But guys, at the core, love does not envy because love is not all about self. Love is not all pointed to trying to gain a mastery or a respect or a notoriety. It's about serving. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 2 says, Let another praise you, and not your own mouth. A stranger, and not your own lips. Nobody loves, nobody likes to be around a person who's like, Yeah, I did this, and I did that, and look at thy trophy. And I. Nobody wants to be around that. Wisdom says, look, if the Lord wants to elevate me, if the Lord wants to give me a platform, if he wants me to make more money, if he wants me to have more friends and more influence, let the Lord do that. Let me be in that place and to use whatever he so gives me. But I want to use that to point other people to him as opposed to living a life to where we are enslaved by envy and boasting. And also verses 4 and 5, love is not arrogant or rude. To be arrogant it has the idea of an exaggerated self-conception. It means, literally, to be a windbag. You ever been in a conversation with somebody who's a windbag? I mean, you don't need to be in hurricane season to encounter high winds. It's just when some people, <laughs> some people talk. And this is the kind of mentality that goes along with boasting. It's just this, this arrogant delusion to where people think that they're actually um, advancing their own self-interest. But it actually turns people off, believe it or not. According to scripture, this is like a form of idolatrous self-worship. And scripture says that it is not arrogant and it is also not rude. Now there's different types of headaches to illustrate this. We have, uh, for example, a migraine headache. It kind of forms right in the back of your eye. You got hypertension in the back of your head. You got stress and it kind of wraps around. And then there's also a type of headache. It's called dealing with narcissists. Can I get a witness for anybody watching out there here in the house where you're like dealing with somebody and everything is about them. It doesn't matter what the conversation is. They're like, yeah, that reminds me of me. Let me tell you a story about me. Oh, that reminds And it just a whole life, their entire perspective, their conversation all reflects on them. There's a meme about narcissism 
And it says, people say I'm a narcissist, but I feel like I'm better than that, right? That's just kind of, the, that's kind of like the definition here of arrogant and rude. J.P. Moreland, an incredible Christian thinker, writer, and philosopher, writes this, that for the narcissist, he said, God becomes another tool in a narcissistic bag of tricks. And man, that can even be a temptation in any local church anywhere on the planet. If you have people, you're going to have the struggle of pride, of arrogance, of self-assertiveness. And I want to encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, just remember that the Lord wants you to take glory in him, and he does not want you to try to chase after the elusive uh, flow leading vapor of trying to build up yourself to other people. Because as a follower of Christ, we are not called to build our own kingdom. We are called to build the kingdom of God. J.C. Ryle, in one of his books to young men, writes this incredibly powerful statement. He says, young men, I beseech you earnestly, beware of pride. Two things are said to be very rare sights in the world. One is a young man humble, and the other is an old man content. You see, whatever life stage you're in, let me speak to to our men for just a moment here directly. No matter what life stage you're in, we all have the propensity. We all have sometimes like just the temptation to be drawn in to a mindset of pride, of narcissism, of arrogance. And some of us are very out there and outspoken. That can make its way, uh, make its manifestation by being a windbag. And others of us are a little bit more behind the scenes, but we all understand the heart condition, and for us to be reminded that love does not act arrogantly. Love is not rude. And notice in verse 5, love does not insist on its own way. Uh, To insist, it it has the idea of being self-seeking. It's not me first. A A follower of Christ, we say, I want it to be the kingdom of God first. Love insists on God's best. Love does not insist on its own way. Jesus says in Luke chapter 12 verse 31, instead seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. It's where when you grow in maturity as a follower of Christ, it no longer everything has to be to your level. You, it doesn't have to be your will, but you want it to be the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. Love also defers. Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 through 5, do nothing from selfish ambition. Or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. This is this is like this is in the Bible. This is this is it. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And here's the reason. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now this doesn't mean that you don't have an opinion. But it simply means that it doesn't have to be your way all the time, every day. And it makes all the difference in the world in a local church. When brothers and sisters in Christ from various backgrounds can say, you know what, maybe the music or, or, or the way that some of us may dress or, or the way that we do groups or this, it, you know, it doesn't always have to be my way. I want what is best for the church. If you have a, a majority perspective that way in your group, in your home, in your family, in your church, in your business, you can get far, far uh, greater results than if it always has to be my way. You remember several years ago, uh, Burger King? Have it what? Your way. Yeah, have it your way. Listen, guys, life is not Burger King. The kingdom of God is not Burger King. Some would say, well, it's Chick-fil-A. I don't know. Like the kingdom of God is not all about me having things my way. It's not about me not having an opinion, but saying I don't have to always insist that it has to be my idea. I don't have to insist on it being what I want. And we're not, we're not talking here. The words of God is not talking about compromising on truth. It's just saying that there's a deep-seated desire for 
the Lord to be glorified, to say, you know what, it doesn't have to be about my preferences. I want it to be about the Lord Jesus Christ. And really, at the end of the day, Jesus is the only one who can say my way is the only way because he's, his way is always the right way. We simply want our perspective and our insistence to be insisting on what he would want. In verse 5, love also is not irritable or resentful. John Phillips uh, says love is not touchy. Love doesn't blow up. A lot of us have been under a lot of pressure for months and months on end. I mean, we just said last week when we um, started our 11.30 a.m. service that it had been eight months and one week since we had had an in-person on campus 11.30 a.m. service. And like you think about the time frame that we've been under, what we're all walking through, there can sometimes be um, a reaction on our part. Maybe, maybe not for some of us, but for a lot of us, we've, we've experienced, you know, somebody asks us a question, we're like, what? We're like, whoa, that, that, like, I just blew up. I was, I was irritable. Like I, that, that, what that person asked me, it, my response wasn't corresponding to simply a question. And maybe uh, we've just got a lot of stuff we're, we're walking through. We've got pressure. Maybe we were, we're in sin. Maybe we're dealing with forgiveness issues. And sometimes we can react that way. But when we are irritable, we ask forgiveness. We don't make excuses for it. So love is not irritable or resentful. Resentful means counting up wrongdoings. It means keeping a list. From 1924 to 1972, J. Edgar Hoover, for 48 years, was the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigations. And uh, he was feared because of something called the Hoover Files. He had detailed files on pretty much anybody in the public eye, and there were even high-ranking government officials that, uh, that had a profound uh, sense of awe and even outright fear about the Hoover files, about what he actually had on them. Now, law enforcement, FBI, that's one thing, but for our personal relationships, our marriages and our families and our relationships just as friends, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you, do not keep a file of grievances against those that you know. May it be that in your heart that you forgive as Christ has forgiven you. It doesn't mean that you forget or that you have amnesia, but it simply means that you are not trying to, I like this picture of vintage calculators for our calculator crowd there, numbers folks, like that you've got all of these lists and you're counting everything up. Because guess what? You'll never be able to have an effective, deep relationship if you live the calculator lifestyle. If every time somebody does something, you're like, I'm going to count that up and I'm going to put that in my J. Edgar Hoover files because next time we argue, I'm going to bring that up from 1972. I'm going to bring that up from 2005. I'm going to bring that up from last week. No, to be able to live in an atmosphere of love, brothers and sisters, we've got to stop using the calculator. We've got to clean out the files. We're not talking about uh, removing any type of boundary if there's been abuse there or something uh, uh, horrific. We're not talking about being unwise. We're just simply saying that love does not have a spirit of resentfulness. It does not harbor a sense of injury. In verse 6, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. That means no matter what, even if it means that I need to change, I rejoice with what is true. And then verse 7, an incredible summary. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and it endures all things. Believing all things doesn't have to do with believing every conspiracy theory or everything that you see on an infomercial. It doesn't mean that you're being gullible. It simply means a disposition whereby your posture, whereby you want to believe what is best, from the people in your life. It means that you give the benefit of the doubt. It means that you allow them to be able to explain their position. What did you mean by this? As opposed to trying to read into, somebody out there listening to me, I hope that you are, instead of trying to read into, well, what did you mean by this? Are you trying to say this? And I'm like, no, all I said was this. But guys, that is, that is a way to where our relationships will never get to where God has intended them to be if we are not 
willing to believe the best. And I would encourage you, whether it's in your professional relationships or in your home relationships, resolve to believe the best. Have a disposition that gives the benefit of the, da- of the doubt. This past week, we were able to go over to uh, some of our friend's house, and uh, we were there outside uh, in their driveway. Our boys brought their bikes and uh, drove the bikes around, and my friend, he's 91 years old. His wife, she's in her mid-80s, and just godly, godly people. They've loved Jesus for many decades. They've just grown deeper in their faith for Jesus and their love for one another, honestly. He was born in 1929. And so we're sitting out there in the driveway, and we've, we're socially distanced in the driveway outside. We've got on mask, and he was saying, you know, Pastor, there, there is the struggle, um, not just of what is happening in the world, but there's also the struggle of isolation. Like, isolation is a struggle in itself. That's hard. That brings its own set of challenges. But he said this, he says, but I am an eternal optimist. And he began to talk about the goodness of God and about how God is still at work in the world. I'm thinking, man, I want to be like my friend. If I ever get to 91 years old, I want to look back and say, you know what? There's been a lot happen in my lifetime, but one thing I know is that God is still at work in the world. You see, here's, if, you're, if you're like a really uh, skeptical type of thinker uh, person, this hopes for all things. You're like, no, 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 no. I got to see data. Listen, the data is that God is alive. The data is that Jesus rose from the dead. And if any of that is true, it changes the entire spectrum. It changes everything. So we're not in like this room or this church building saying we got to be positive, positive, positive. We got to be happy, 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 joy, joy, joy. And just like this pipe dream. No, our hope is grounded in reality. And our reality is that God is alive. And if that's true, then it actually is rational and reasonable to believe and hope in all things because we've got a God who is alive and who is still at work in the world. There may be somebody out there here in the house or out there watching the church online that just needs to stand and point at the TV screen right now. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another. How? Earnestly, with passion, with vigor. Since love covers a multitude of sins. How does a marriage last? Love that covers a multitude of sins. How do friendships endure throughout pressure? Keep loving one another earnestly. Be selfless. So several takeaways from this passage of Scripture. Number one would be, going back to verse 4, why do I struggle with envy? If in fact you do, why is it? I mean, ask yourself that. Ask the Lord. Why is it that I struggle with these intense feelings of frustration when I see other people prospering? Could it be insecurity? I mean, for some of us, could it be like fear of replacement, fear of becoming irrelevant? Like, why is it that I struggle with envy? And one of the deepest questions you can ask underneath that would be, what does Jesus say about that? If I feel just these feelings of frustration, insecurity, I may be replaced, I may be looked at as not the best or the prettiest or the most popular, what does Jesus say about that? And Jesus tells us that he is always with us. He will never forsake us, and he is in our corner. He is our father. We've been adopted. If you're a follower of Christ, you've been adopted into his family. And no matter the situation that you're in in your life, he has the desire for your good, and he's got the power to bring that about, even if it means that we walk through suffering, even if it means that some people walk away from us. Why do I struggle with envy? Brothers and sisters, if you do, remember Jesus. Number two. Do I rejoice with, this is a hard one, this is a hard one. Do I rejoice with the truth, even if it means I need to change? Come on. It is, it's not only, can we be really honest? It's not only easy, it's like sometimes downright enjoyable to rejoice with the truth when it means that our enemies need to change. You know what I mean? Like that, that truth bomb that just, is unwrapped and unveiled, and we see clearly, and everybody sees clearly, our enemies, 
Those we don't like, those we disagree with, they're like, ooh, I've been wrong. We're like, yeah, rejoice with that. Rejo- How's that? How do you like that? How, right? That's, man, that's enjoyable to rejoice with the truth when it means somebody else needs to change. But what is my reaction? Maybe a question for you to ask is, I mean, what do I, what do I really want? Do I want the truth to use as a bludgeon to try to get other people to change? Or is maybe there's some lag time in my life? And what I mean by that is maybe when you're reading the Bible, maybe when you're listening to a sermon, and God just hits you right between the eyes. It's a tough truth. It means that there's something in your life that needs to change. Is there, is, how much lag time is it when the truth comes to you and you know that there's an attitude, an action, maybe a pattern of thinking, a pattern of behavior in your life that is not glorifying to God and you know that needs to be repented of, that needs to be forsaken. If there's, if there's a lot of lag time there, it may be, again, effective to say, what do I really want? Do I really want the truth? Do I really want to see God move in a powerful way? And I'd encourage you to say, Lord, I want to rejoice with the truth even if and when it means that I need to change. And finally, what has God allowed me to bear and endure? Some of you are walking through and bearing and enduring incredible burdens. And guys, I don't know all that so many of you are walking through. Only the Lord knows, ultimately and totally. It may be even that your best friend doesn't know the depths of what you have had to bear and endure. Maybe it's just your mom and dad. They, 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 don't, they don't even get it. But how can enduring the things that you have endured lead to greater things? The Apostle Paul talks about suffering. And suffering is this, he calls it this light momentary affliction that is compared to an eternal weight of glory. No matter the level of what you're walking through and trying to endure, God can use what you are enduring, those things to lead to far greater things in your life. And you know, the beautiful part of this passage is we could actually read these verses and insert the word Jesus for the word love. We could say, verse 4, Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not arrogant or rude. Jesus does not insist on his own way. Jesus is not irritable or resentful. Jesus does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth because Jesus is the truth. Jesus bears all things. Jesus believes all things. He hopes all things, and he has endured all things for us. So how can we say no to Jesus Christ today? If you're not yet a follower of Christ, and by that I don't mean just somebody who identifies as Christian on your Facebook profile. I mean somebody who's following Jesus. How can you not say yes to the love of Jesus Christ? He came to this world to redeem us, a race, a human race, all the ethnicities, all of the continents, all of us together who were broken in our sin and our trespasses. But Jesus Christ came to redeem us to the Father. So I would encourage you, just today, would you be willing to give your life and your heart to Jesus Christ? Would you be willing to to say yes to Jesus? Let us know through the Connect card. Let us know. We will follow up with you and walk with you as God is working in your life. It may be that you need to be baptized and you, or you have questions about that. Let us know through the Connect card and we'll follow up with you. May the Lord bless you. Have an incredible week with your family and Thanksgiving. And we'll see you this coming Sunday. How deep the Father's love for us. How beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face
Thank you so much for being with us today at Grace Online. In our new series, In the Name of Love, through 1 Corinthians 13, we'll be looking at what love is from God's perspective. If you're ready to follow Jesus, if you want to be baptized by immersion, if you need prayer, or if you have a question about the Bible, let us know by filling out the online connect card and we will reach out to you. You can also help others by simply sharing this content. After this service, take some time and pray for those with you. If you're alone, I would encourage you to reach out to someone else and ask how you can pray for them. Finally, if you're a member or a regular attender and God has placed it on your heart to give, you can do so by clicking the give link below. May the Lord bless you and we look forward to seeing you online or in person next Sunday.